Good morning. Welcome to Olive Branch this morning. We are excited to see what the Lord is going to do for us, um, not only today, but in the coming days as we prepare our hearts toward Christmas. Um, I want to start this morning with some announcements and some prayer concerns. Um, we are going to be celebrating communion today at the end of service. Uh, there are communion cups on the back table. Um, so if you did not pick one up, uh, we get, we'll give you the opportunity to do that a little later. Um, if, if we run low, we have extras, so don't, don't panic. Um, I think Richard and Mike have got their eye on them, and we'll make sure everybody has one. Um, our kids are in Christmas practice, um, and uh, so uh, they'll be having Christmas practice. Uh, did you want to say something about that? Right. So after church today, um, they're going to be uh, getting their costumes. They're downstairs in the uh, chapel building. Uh, parents, if you can go over with your kids and help them find their costume, that would be great. Um, so, uh, and also the uh, the merge kids are having a church. They're having their Christmas program practice uh, today as well. Uh, I want to thank everybody that came out for the church work day yesterday. Uh, we appreciated that. Um, the Association Christmas Program is at New Liberty tonight uh, at 6 o'clock. If you're interested in that, we invite you to go out for that. Um, our Sunday School Program is continuing. Richard is teaching a, a, a class on uh, an Anthony Evans Bible study and, on the armor of God. And Adam is uh, teaching and leading a study based on Christian service. And if you have, uh, if you have social media and you're on Facebook and, and on our Facebook page, uh, Adam put a, a form on there, a Google Doc, Mike. Because the world revolves around Google Docs. Um, there's a Google document on there that you can fill out if you know someone who needs something, who um, uh, needs some kind of a project done and is unable to get that done. And, and the, the class and others are working on, uh, are working on trying to, to fulfill some of that Christian service. Um, the, uh, the, Christ the annual Christmas party at Madison State Hospital will be this coming Thursday, December 9th. Unfortunately, this year, again, we are not able to, uh, to actually be in person with them. It will be a virtual party. Um, and uh, so there are some lists out there. There are very specific things uh, from food to gifts that we're allowed to give them. Um, so you can look at those lists out in the lobby. Um, and I will be delivering that stuff to the state hospital on Thursday afternoon. So if during the week you um, come across some things that you would like to give, uh, the easiest way probably is to take them to the newspaper office uh, during the day or give me a call and we'll make arrangements to get them. Um, but that is this Thursday. Um, just a reminder that our two during the week Bible studies, Tom's Bible study and Melissa's women's Bible study, are uh, both taking a break until after the holidays. And then um, our final announcement tonight is that uh, we'll be having our live nativity scene. We haven't had a chance to do that in, in several years because um, of the construction of this building for one. But uh, we are going to have that again on Sunday evening, December the 19th. And it's going to be at 6 p.m. There are different stations. If you, if you aren't familiar with it, um, there are different stations around. Um, Visitors will encounter King Herod, and then they'll uh, uh, be at the inn with the innkeeper, and then they'll encounter they'll uh, encounter the angels. They'll be like they're the shepherds in the fields. They'll encounter the angels, and then they'll end up at the nativity. So um, we need people to do that. Uh, we also need uh, people to serve as like a host that kind of takes them through. Uh, so there are different things. Uh, we as much as possible. This is going to be inside, so people don't have to be out uh, out in the cold. Um, and then uh, we'll have cookies and hot chocolate and stuff in here, so we'll need people to provide cookies for that. So that's always, a, uh, that's always been a real blessing as we get to Christmas. Um, out by the nativity scene that's sitting between the, the two sets of doors as you exit, there's a paper that allows you to sign up for that. We encourage you to sign up and be a part of that. Uh, and also then next Sunday after church, uh, we're going to have a meeting. Mike's going to have a meeting with those people who have signed up and members of his committee, right? 
And uh, so if you're interested, interested in helping uh, with that, uh, please see Mike for more, uh, more answers and uh, plan on being at that meeting and then sign up out there. So those are our announcements for right now. In our uh, uh, prayer uh, time, uh, we want to continue to remember Debbie Price's dad. He's had some, he had some health issues around Thanksgiving. Um, also, Doug has uh, had, uh, had some pain, but he's here today. So we're glad Doug's here down here on the corner. Uh, hip doing all right? Feeling good? Super. Um, Roger Brooks's brother Emerson was having some spells and some seizures. So we uh, want to uh, continue to remember him. Um, Sean Villardo, uh, he, um, uh, he, um, uh, he worked with, um, uh, his mom and sister worked with Amanda Wallace at Ripley Crossing. Um, he has developed a brain tumor and was having it removed and then had a stroke. So uh, we want to continue to remember them. Uh, the B. Williams family, uh, B. passed away and uh, she was in hospice, so we want to uh, remember her family. Uh, Josh and Heidi Harrell. Um, Josh is up in Cleveland Clinic. He's had some health issues uh, with his heart, and he's up in Cleveland Clinic, and, and they're going to maybe have to redo some things. And, and uh, I know there's a GoFundMe account and some things going on there. Um, but then Heidi developed COVID, so, so Heidi had to leave him and come home to quarantine. So... Um, uh, their son Caleb is in is up in Cleveland with with Josh. So uh, we want to just continue to remember uh, that family uh, as they go through all of this. Um, there's some recent fires in the area. I think there were two fires in the county over the weekend. Uh, some folks lost uh, almost everything. So um, you might be on the lookout. I know there were some posts with some sizes and things like that. So you want to be on the lookout for those and, and pray for those folks. Also, the school shooting that happened this week in Michigan. Um, we want to continue to remember that community. Uh, Wayne Scudder's brother, Dale. We have an update on Dale. He checked himself out of the hospital. So he is Wayne's brother. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and then we all we want to continue to remember Ashley and Ryan Barnes, uh, Amanda and T.J. Hobson, uh, Jeremiah and Haley Smith, the Brooks and Copeland families. Um, Liz Schilling is in hospice with brain cancer. Um, she is uh, connected to Megan Marie and Adam. Um, Marianne's sister Helen is doing, she's doing fine. So we praise uh, God for that. Uh, Renzi's cousin's husband, Jimmy Pittman, um, uh, he has cirrhosis of the liver and wasn't doing well. Um, Kevin Donahue, Roger Brooks's cousin up in Michigan, he had a stroke and is in rehab. Uh, Levada Bladen continues her treatments. Um, uh, Harry Rail and his family. Harry is Eric Rail's dad. Um, he has stage four cancer and is going through treatments. So we want to continue to remember Harry and also his family as they go through that. And then um, we kind of get to Jill every Sunday. And I always say, remember Jill with her, um, as she deals with pancreatic cancer. Jill is such a foundational part of our church family. Um, and we just love her so much. And uh, um, she had a birthday recently and, and uh, she continues to just be a, a, a huge beacon uh, of hope and faith um, as she goes through this. And uh, we, we wanna continue to remember Jill and, uh, and, and love on Jill from afar. And uh, so we are, um, we stand amazed at what God has done with Jill and what God does through Jill. So we thank, uh, we, we ask that you remember Jill. Um, so uh, would you join me in prayer at this time? 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here. And, and Father, as we, as we pause for just a moment to, to um, consider these, these prayer requests, these prayer concerns, things that, that are heavy upon our minds, things that are heavy upon our hearts, Father, help not only heal those folks, but also, Father, give us an assurance that, that you already know about these things, that, that you knew they were going to happen an eternity ago, and, and you know what's going to happen in the future. And Father, what you want most is for us to, just, to develop a heart and mindset that, that allows us to turn these things over to you, that, that allows us to bring them to you like a child brings thing, concerns to their parent, share them with you, and ultimately, Father, leave them with you. Father, we're blessed with your presence here today. We ask your hand of protection and blessing be upon all of those we have mentioned and the other unspoken requests that, that we have not talked about today. Father, we just ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, if everybody will please stand, we're going to start out with a Christmas song. A little town of Bethlehem. <laughs> oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together, Proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us. Our Lord Emmanuel. All right. Tom's going to lead us in with the roll. A couple songs about heaven. trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks to turn bright and fair when the sailors shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the Yonder I'll be there On that 
bright and cloud this morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is gone up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 yonder, I'll be there. So let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and all Yonder I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder 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 I'll be there We're going to do it when we all get to heaven Would you please pray for us? Amen. You may be seated. All right, uh, kids, you can uh, head to uh, Children's Church. Jenny, merge in here. So, kids going to Children's Church, teens going to merge. Everybody's moving around. I was fortunate uh, in getting ready for this sermon to find Greg Coy's senior picture. Um, if you're uh, if you're my age or around my age, you know that uh, you probably spent a lot of your school years drawing peace signs on uh, stuff, right? Uh, 
the uh, or the big balloon hands like this remember those and you draw one and then you draw lines around it and you go all the way out to the end of the paper and you thought you were really cool and now you find that stuff and you think wow i must have been a big dork but uh um today's our second sunday of advent and 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 today i want to start with a couple of questions and and uh, it starts with what does it mean to have peace uh, you know we 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 talk about peace a lot but what does it mean to to have peace. Uh, more importantly, what does it mean to be peaceful? Um, you know, because you can be a peaceful person and not be in a situation where there is peace. And as we enter our second week of Advent, the, the time in which we focus our hearts and our minds toward the coming birth of our Savior, um, last week we talked about what it meant to have hope. Hope for something better to come in our lives. Uh, hope that what we have uh, been told will actually happen. It's, it's looking to the future with, with that sense that something great is going to occur. We just don't know when that is going to happen. And today, like I said, in the second week of Advent, we, we begin with peace. Peace. You know, when we think about peace, most of the time we think about world peace, right? Um, peace among countries, peace among sections of the world, among um, segments of, of society, be it religious or having other um, differences between them. Finding peace in such a way that, that groups and countries will cease fighting and find a time of peace. And I'm a history bus, buff, and and I uh, uh, have read during World War One they would have they would have um, they would stop fighting over Christmas. They would spend 24 hours of Christmas Day not fighting, and and um, they would they would have just that one short time of peace. In fact, they would come in, out of their their bunkers and foxholes. Um, there are actually pictures of both sides, both warring sides, coming together in the middle and enjoying food and 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 uh, and things like that, uh, and almost in celebration. And then a few hours later, they're back in their foxholes shooting at each other. But for Christmas, they all found this time of peace, and we should pray for world peace. We should pray for a greater peace because like I said most of the time we think about world peace but but we should also pray today and this week that each of us would focus on what it means for each of us to have peace individual peace peace in our lives and peace in our souls our second candle of Advent today is called the Angel's Candle, and I'm going to ask Adam to come up. He's going to light not only the, uh, the prophet's candle from last week when we talked about hope, but also today the, the Angel's Candle as we talk about peace. And as he lights those, we're reminded that, that God sent his Son into the world not only to give us hope, but also to give us peace. We have several scriptures this morning, but uh, as Adam lights the, the angel's candle, I think it's appropriate to, to read the two encounters by angels to the parents of Jesus. In both cases, his words to Mary and Joseph not only proclaimed the coming Savior and, and their role in it, but also calmed them down, assured them and brought them peace. Our first scripture is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter one. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to that or it's gonna be on the screens. Uh, Luke chapter one, when uh, the, this Luke begins his gospel with this famous Christmas story that, that we use a lot. First chap uh, Luke chapter one, beginning in verse 26, we see these words. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. 
The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a, a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. And the second account is in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 1, right after uh, Matthew records this lineage of Jesus in, in chapter 1, verses 18, beginning in verse 18, we again see this other account, this time to Joseph. Matthew writes, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, that before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not, he did not consummate the marriage until after she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So ends the reading of God's word. Pray with me to, this morning. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for these words. And, and I just ask, Father, that you would open not only our minds, but also our hearts as we prepare ourselves for Christmas. That as we see how Joseph and Mary were given a time of peace, that as we move towards the, the occasion of the birth of your son, that, that we would find peace in our own hearts as well. Father, we love you. We're honored by your presence. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Have you ever struggled with a decision? Pondered it in your mind over and over? Maybe laying awake at night trying to figure out what to do about it? Just worry about it all the time? It consumes your thoughts? You know, I think we all have, at one stage or another, had those kinds of things go on, right? And then... After you finally figure out what to do, people ask you if, if you're okay with your decision. And at that point, have you ever said something like, well, I, I've come to peace with my decision, or I'm at peace with my decision. I've come to peace with it. In these times, why do we find peace with what we've been struggling with. I mean, we can make a decision. Sometimes the choice is a clear one. But there are times when even knowing what the right thing to do doesn't really sit well inside of us, does it? I know it's the right thing to do. But there's something about it that just bothers me. See, in those times, we aren't necessarily coming to peace with ourselves, but we're coming to peace with the world. 
So we have these two passages of Scripture. One of them, Gabriel's visit to Mary, might be more, much more familiar than the other one, the angel appearing in Joseph's dream. In our first, we find this young girl, Mary. We're told she's about 14. So put in your mind some 14-year-old girl out there that you know. She's asleep in her bed and this angel appears in her room. And we all have these images of angels, right? This wispy little girl with long blonde hair and big angel wings, right? The white, little white robe. But the image of an angel is, that we think of is far from the angels that we see in the Bible. Because this angel is the angel Gabriel, Luke tells us. And he shows up at different times through scripture and, and, angel, er, and, and Gabriel is one big, powerful, strong dude. He is not this tiny little blonde haired girl. He's this massive dude. So here's this young girl suddenly awoke in their room by this big beam of light and there's this big powerful man standing there. Now what would your reaction be, right? I think we can all guess. But before Gabriel tells Mary anything, because remember, at this point, Mary hasn't been clued in on what's about to happen. She knows nothing about why he's there. And before he tells her anything, the first thing he does is calm her down. Verse 30, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Do not be afraid. In a moment where Mary has every reason to be terrified, Gabriel calms her down and gives her a sense of peace in her heart. And then, after telling Mary what was going to happen, the angel again gives her a sense of peace about it all by answering her question. Verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Now, I want to pause here for a second because sometimes I think we miss this part in our lives today. When we feel like God is taking us in a direction that we aren't sure of, there are many times when we're afraid to ask why. I mean, we think that it's a sign of weakness in our beliefs to somehow question God. But I think we look at it in those times in entirely the wrong way. We look at it like God is going to see our question as a rebellion, don't we? Like we're trying to get him to change his mind about something. But here's a piece of reality. If God wants it to happen, it's going to happen, right? So, if we understand that us changing jobs or moving to a new city or forgiving someone for something unforgivable, if we see all of those things as something that, that's going to happen anyway, then we can begin to see our questions in a whole new light. We aren't asking God or questioning God out of rebellion, but instead we're asking and God is answering in order to find peace in what's taking place. Can you see that? Well, God, I, I don't understand why you would do this. And at that point, God says, okay, here's why. Right? I don't understand what's going on in my life. Please help me understand so I can be at peace with it. So the angel's encounter with, in the angel's encounter with Mary, 
He's giving her new information. And today in our world, that can throw us off too, can't it? But for Mary, like us, once the angel explains God's plan and God's purpose, how can this be? Well, here's how it can be. Oh, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left. See, she didn't question him out of rebellion. She questioned him out of... And there are a couple of questions here we need to answer. And I think sometimes we get afraid to ask God things because, because we feel like God's going to look down and go, why are you questioning me? I think God enjoys us questioning him because I think it gives God the opportunity to calm us down and to give us peace. And when we look at this encounter between Gabriel and Mary, are we willing to be the Lord's servant even when it wasn't our idea in the first place? Because sometimes I think we think, okay, God, here's what I'm going to do and I need you to be okay with it. And this was my idea and I think it's going to work great. And in those cases, we feel like, okay, I'm serving God because I'm doing this. But are we willing to be servants when God looks at us and says, I know you had no idea this was coming, but here's what I want you to do. So the second scripture this morning is in Matthew. And it has a little different angle. Because Joseph, the man who's supposed to marry Mary, at the point that we pick this up, he's already been let in on the situation. See, when, the, when Gabriel visits Mary, she's completely unaware that any of this is about to take place. But when the angel visits Joseph in the dream, he already knows full well what's going on. Because at this point, Mary has told Joseph that she's pregnant. And Joseph is very confident that he's not the father. Now, in those times, it was perfectly acceptable for a man to break a betrothal, a man to break an engagement for any reason. But the fact that your wife-to-be is carrying a baby that you're not the father of would certainly be at the top of that list. Not only then, but it'd be pretty high up on the list today, right? In fact, public disclosure by Joseph of this situation could have met with Mary's death and the baby's too. And no one would have thought a thing about it. But there's a glitch in the system. Joseph loves Mary. Joseph loves her. See, if he didn't, we would never get to this dream in Matthew. Because moments after she told him, he would have been in the streets publicly shaming her. That's what the world would tell him to do, right? She broke your heart. Make her life miserable. And if he didn't love her, we would never get to this dream. See, at the time he's told all of this, he, all he knows is what Mary has told him. There hasn't been a visit from an angel or a dream yet. What he bases his feelings on are his feelings. What he bases his response on are his feelings. So the fact that we even get to Joseph and his dream encounter is a testament to how much he loved Mary. But look how Matthew phrases this encounter. He says in verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So Joseph is struggling here 
with what I believe we struggle with all the time. Do I do what's right in the eyes of society? Do I do what's right in the eyes of what I've been taught all my life? Or do I extend mercy to this woman who I love? Do I do what the world tells me I should do? Or do I do what my heart tells me I should do? I think we struggle with that all the time. When we make choices and when we make decisions, here's what the world says. But here's what my heart says. Now before we get to verse 20, it's important to know, like I said, that Joseph has already settled on his decision. He's not going to publicly shame Mary. That's why in verse 20, Matthew writes, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. See, Joseph has already made what he considers to be a merciful decision towards Mary. But it's at that moment when an angel appears to him in a dream. And some of the first words that the angel spoke to him in that dream, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. In this case, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Because although this situation throws your world into chaos, it is precisely in line with God's plan of redemption. That baby inside Mary was put there by the Holy Spirit. And when she has this baby, you're going to give him the name Jesus, not your family name as tradition holds, but you're going to name him Jesus. Now, side note here, if Joseph wanted to, he could put her away quietly and he could marry her and keep her out of public eye and she could have this baby and Joseph could give that baby his family name and it would help kind of cover this up. So the fact that this word's going to get out anyway, and then the fact that you're not going to give him the family name, that's going to cause some people to talk. There's no way to get around this. So Joseph's out there, right? You're going to give him the name Jesus. You're, you're not going to give him your family name as tradition holds. Well, why? Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. This just isn't some son you're having. You're a part of a great big story. And then the angel, I think anyway, answers a question that Joseph might have had had he not been dreaming. The angel quotes the prophet Isaiah. Remember, Matthew had told us that Joseph was faithful to the law. Verse 22, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Joseph, here's the deal. The woman you're betrothed to, the woman you're engaged to, she's fulfilling that. She's fulfilling that prophecy. She's fulfilling that word that you have committed to your memory your whole life. That is happening and you're a part of it. Just in case you had any questions. Matthew says it's at that point that Joseph woke up. And when he did, he did exactly what the angel had, ur had urged him to do. He took Mary home as his wife. She gave birth to a son. And Joseph named him Jesus. As we look at those scriptures, I am always mindful that we know something they don't know. 
we know the rest of the story, right? We, we open our Bibles and, and we know that Mary is going to have this baby and we know that Joseph is going to care for her and the baby and we know what the mission of the baby is for, for coming to this earth in the first place. We know all of it. We know the story and we know the end of the story. But Mary and Joseph, they didn't know any of that. They weren't reading it in some book. They were living it. And we look and we read that and we go, oh, now, you know, Mary should have been faithful because, you know, this is all going to happen. Well, you're 14 and you're getting information overload, right? Well, Joseph should have been faithful and he should have understood what the prophet Isaiah said. Whoa. Joseph's not out of this story reading it and seeing and skipping a few pages ahead. He's living in the middle of it. They didn't know the story. They knew the situation. And in those moments, I believe that the angel was sent to both of them to give them a sense of peace about what was going to happen. Because once they came to peace with it, then they could find peace in it. And that little boy, well, John chapter 14, verse 27, quotes him as an adult when he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do, not give, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And John quotes him again in chapter 16, verse 33. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble but take heart, I have overcome the world. So he doesn't say, I've told you these things so that you may be rich. I've told you these things so that you may never have any issues in your life. I've, to I've told you these things so that you may never have any struggles in your life. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, inner peace. Over and over again, Jesus speaks in scripture that he wants us to have peace. He wants us to be peaceful. Not necessarily world peace, but like I said, inner peace. Is the chaos going on around us? Yes but we see the bigger picture. We see the end of the story. We see the coming victory. And when we see those things, we can have a peace that Paul writes to, to the church in Philippi. In chapter four, verse seven. Philippians chapter four, verse seven says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Family, Jesus came to this earth to give us many things. But after our eternal salvation, I think what he wants most for each of us as we await that day is not only a sense of peace, but an assurance of peace. And as we approach Christmas, let us do so not only with a sense of hope for our future, but also an assurance of peace <clears throat> in our lives. Mike, would you close us in a word of prayer? God sent his son called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he 
put in time to buy my pardon and empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he all fear is gone because I know He holds the future and life is worth the living just because He lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because Christ lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross the river I'll find thy spine No more with pain And then as death Gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory He lives, I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is gone because I know He holds the future and life is worth the living just. Because he lives. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you did not have a chance to get the elements of communion and would like to participate with us this morning, they're back on the back table. You know, we uh, normally read out of uh, uh, the Gospel of Matthew when we talk about communion. Uh, but today we're going to... Uh, Use the scripture, here they come. Charge. This morning, uh, we're going to read from 1 Corinthians, Paul's uh, letter to the church in Corinth, when he talks about uh, how they should conduct things and how they should conduct themselves and 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 different elements and and in chapter 11 of first corinthians he talks about how to conduct your con your conduct at the lord's supper not just how you conduct it but what your conduct should be at it and then he in the institution of lord's supper and in chapter 11 verse 23 paul writes for i received from the lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Greg, would you ask a blessing upon the bread, please? Amen. He took the bread and shared his body 
with his believers. And then in verse 25, it said, In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Chase, would you ask a blessing upon the cup, please? His blood of the new covenant. I read that to you today, because after he gets done with that, then he says this. Examine yourselves. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of Christ. But let a man examine himself, so that it, so let and so let him drink or eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, while not discerning the Lord's body. You know, I think sometimes we forget to examine ourselves when we, when we do this, when we have times of communion, when we have times when we commune with God that, that Paul writes that we're supposed to examine ourselves and how we're living our lives. And, and I think, find peace in that. That sometimes when we, when we stumble, we're blessed that, that God is there to pick us up and to help us move forward. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we're going to close, and in just a second, then I've got something else I need to tell you before you leave. But uh, I'm gonna, we're going to close with the uh, doxology this morning, and then, um, where'd everybody go? Richard's back there. I'm going to ask Richard to close us in prayer. We'll stand. Richard will close us in prayer. We'll sing the doxology, and then i got something else for you to, to tell you, and then you'll be dismissed. Is that clear as mud? Richard.